Chapel Podcast. Our speaker of the morning is a senior professor of Bible exposition, Dr. Ron Allen. Prior to arriving at DTS, he enjoyed a 25-year tenure as professor of Hebrew scripture at Western Seminary in Portland, Oregon. In addition to his teaching responsibilities, he maintains a very active conference speaking ministry uh, across the country and around the world. He has also served as a guest professor in schools in Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. And for many years, he's led tours to Israel, Turkey, Greece, Jordan, and Egypt. He's written numerous books, commentaries, and articles on Old Testament books and themes. He is one of three senior editors of the New King James Version, the Old Testament, as well as the Old Testament editor and principal contributor to the Nelson Study Bible. Uh, The topic of worship has been of particular interest to him. He's written numerous books on the subject and has been a frequent consultant for for Maranatha Music. It was while I was a student at Western Seminary that I sat under chapels in which he spoke and a portion of a class that he taught and team taught with some other professors but a few people have given me a better appreciation for the majesty of our God than Dr. Ron Allen. So would you join me in welcoming our brother, our colleague, our mentor, and our friend to Dallas Theological Seminary Chapel. The uh, honor of speaking at Dallas Seminary is not lost on me. I take this as just a wonderful, wonderful privilege. Last week in chapel, among the four speakers, two had been my professors 40 years ago. (laughs) It's true. Dr. Campbell and uh, Dr. Pentecost, well, they were much younger then, (laughs) and so was I. And in addition to those two, there are two on the platform today, Dr. Toussaint and uh, Prof. Dr. Hendricks, uh, who are my teachers as well. And it's hard to believe that uh, next May I'll be standing with uh, groups of people who've come from a wide variety of places to celebrate the 40th anniversary of graduating from Dallas Seminary. <sighs> Last week, when Dr. Campbell spoke, he had us turn to the book of Revelation. Now, that shouldn't be a surprise uh, at Dallas Seminary. After all, in the history of Dallas Seminary, uh, we have made much of the prophetic scriptures. Dr. Pentecost, uh, uh, more than others, uh, worldwide in ministry, and uh, Bible prophecy is a very important part of the history and tradition and heritage of Dallas Seminary. So it shouldn't be a surprise that a message comes from the book of Revelation in the first week of chapel. It also wouldn't be a surprise if someone were to turn to the book of Ephesians. I think those two books have marked the history of Dallas Seminary perhaps more than any other. The book of Ephesians, because of its teaching on the distinctiveness of the church, its singularity, the fact that God in olden times, when Gentile people came to faith in God, He grafted them in to the people group of Israel. But now in our era, Jewish people who come to faith in Yeshua and Gentile people who come to faith in the Lord Jesus are part of a new entity, um, and that's the church. And here at Dallas Seminary, we make much of that. And our founder, Louis Berry Chafer, wrote a small book on uh, Ephesians, the Ephesian letter, doctrinally considered. And uh, my understanding is this was a favorite area of his teaching. More recently, another very small book has been written (laughs) on the book of Ephesians. (laughs) Yes. magnum opus of Harold Honer. (laughs) It is. And what an achievement, and what a central part of the heritage, again, of Dallas Seminary. 
Now, the thing that was surprising last week was when Dr. Campbell turned to Revelation, um, he didn't talk about charts and, and um, sequences of events and issues of uh, what will soon occur and what will be thereafter, but he focused on worship in Revelation chapter 4 and 5. And I sat back there just loving it. <laughs> because while our interest in Revelation uh, is rightly uh, centered on prophecy, yet it remains another part of the purpose of that book to talk about God's holy worship. And my friend at Talbot Seminary and Biola University, uh, Barry Leish, has written an entire book on worship in the book of Revelation. And when we think about the book of Ephesians, we usually think of theology, don't we? And when we think of theology, we usually don't think of worship. Uh, my friend Robert Weber has been one of the most vocal and articulate proponents of worship in the evangelical church in the last 30 years. We, when he began teaching at Wheaton College, he was told by his then uh, uh, dean that he should not expect ready advancement in his career since the area that he planned to focus on is more a trifling matter, worship, than a central issue in the theological curriculum. But Bob Weber served out his um, career at Wheaton and became renowned over the English-speaking world and beyond, and after mandatory retirement went to Northern Baptist Seminary and recently went to be with the Lord. And he is, was as enthusiastic in his last days uh, of the subject and the importance of worship as he was as a young professor so many years ago. So I'd like to ask you to turn to the book of Ephesians. And I know that's double chutzpah with Harold Horner sitting right <laughs> at my side. But I'd like you to open to the book of Ephesians, to chapter 1. And instead of thinking about um, the great theological issues of this book, I'd like for us to see something that has not been emphasized as much as I think it ought be, and that's the worship theme in the book of Ephesians. Uh, when we come to the Bible, we bring a lot of things with us. And when we come to the Bible with certain interests, it's amazing to see how those interests are found to be reflected there. Years ago, 1989, I began riding a bicycle with some regularity as an adult. I'd ridden before in 74, and I was hit by a car and uh, escaped death and God's kindness, and our senior professor of theology at the time at Western uh, upbraided me in the direst terms and said, you don't ride a bicycle if you want to honor God with your life. <laughs> so I didn't for years. But in 1989, helmets had come into play. And uh, there were no helmets in common use in 1974. And I thought, well, with a helmet I can ride. Now, um, when I started riding, I, I discovered things I hadn't noticed before. And one day, I was at 20th and Hawthorne in Portland. Our seminary there is 55th and Hawthorne. And it was late one afternoon, and I'd done an errand on my bike. And um, I was riding back to the seminary um, and then riding home. And I heard a hiss, an awful sound. And I looked down, and I had a flat in my rear tire. And that's not a bad thing. Uh, flats happen when you're cycling. But it was bad that day because for some silly reason, I hadn't brought my tool kit with me, left it in my office. So I didn't have a pump, I didn't have a tube, I didn't have a patch kit, I didn't have anything. And the thought of walking my bike uphill from 20th to 55th in the rain was really daunting. And then I just looked as I started walking, and at 20th and Hawthorne, I saw a bicycle shop. I couldn't believe it. 
And I made my way there, and I went in, and I talked to the mechanic, and I said, could you fix a flat? And he said, sure, as they always do, interrupting his work. And then I was just talking with enthusiasm how excited I was that they put this bike shop here. And uh, I said, how long have you been here? And he said, 25 years. <laughs> I said, no, you haven't. I've lived in Portland since 1970. This is 1989. I've never seen this before. He said, well, how long have you been cycling? Well, just a few months. He says, well, that's the reason. You didn't need a bike shop then, and so your eyes weren't looking for it. But he said, within a few weeks, you're going to know the placement of every bike shop in the city. <laughs> so when I started writing on the subject of worship, I start seeing worship themes where others have seen them but have not really developed them. In Ephesians 1, verses 3 to 14, is one of the most remarkable sentences in all of the New Testament. Think about it. In the Greek text, those verses form one sentence. We can't do that in translation. Our attention span is not long enough <laughs> to hold that together. So it's been doctored up uh, in punctuation so that we can see what's uh, going on here. But in this seeming flow of words, there is a remarkable design and structure and order. And the first thing we see about the design is the Trinitarian nature of this passage. In verse 3, the focus is on the Father. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And those next several verses through verse 6 focus on the work of the Father in our salvation with a particular interest in the difficult concepts of election and foreordination and predestination, concepts that uh, continue to engage the mind and um, to bring about discussion and uh, significant interest. But the work of the Father, not all the, the Father has done in salvation. This is not a complete catalog, but there's an emphasis on the work of the Father in our salvation. Verse 7 begins in Him, and the Him refers to the Lord Jesus, who is mentioned in the earlier verse. And verses 7 uh, through 12 focus on the work of the Son in our salvation, with a particular focus on redemption by His blood, and that achievement of the mystery that Paul will develop later in the book more fully. And then the last section, verse 13 and 14, there's a focus on the work of the Spirit, particularly centered on His sealing ministry. Now, in no case is there a complete catalog, but in each of these units of this magnificent sentence, there is a focus of the work of the Father in our salvation, the work of the Son in our salvation, and the work of the Spirit in our salvation. And each of them nicely is concluded with a recurring phrase. And the phrase is found, to the praise of the glory of His grace. That's in verse 6. And uh, then we have it again in verse 12, to the praise of His glory. And then we have it at the end of verse 14, to the praise of His glory. And all commentators are aware of that and all have done word studies of the word praise and the word glory, and they've seen how these words are found in the uh, translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, many, many times, and how they translate Hebrew words, that these are Hebrew concepts that are in the New Testament. When I said turn to Ephesians, some of you must have said, huh? I thought this is Dr. Allen. He teaches from the old. Well, you know what? I love the words of Dr. Kaiser, who spoke at commencement a few years ago, and he said, I've read the New Testament. <laughs> and then he said, I like it. <laughs> and then he said, it reminds me so much of the old. 
<laughs> so I've read the New Testament too, and I like it, and it reminds me so much of the old. So these words, all grammarians have understood that these mark the end of that subsection of this long sentence, and it gives this sentence remarkable stability and structure and uh, beauty of design. But what has not been emphasized sufficiently in my hearing is that these are words that call for response. When it says to the praise of His glory, that's just not a concluding phrase. That's just not something that we write a, a paper on and show how that phrase marks the end of each of these subunits of this magnificent sentence. Those are calls for worship. To the praise of His glory means that when we think about the work of the Father, we should burst forth into song. When we think about the, word, uh, the work of the Savior, Jesus, we should reach out to others with a message of salvation. And when we think about the work of the Spirit, we should bow in prayer collectively, thanking God for what He has done. These are not just words that serve as endings of units or segment uh, headings or, or something just to make good style. Ephesians is a worship text, and you only see it when you're thinking about worship. It's like thinking about bikes. Now, I've said enough about bicycling except to say that I have a friend on this platform who is also a cyclist. He didn't want me to say this. I begged him, and he said, all right, say it quickly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but Dr. Gary Barnes of our faculty uh, competed in an amazing, grueling race this June, the Race Across America. And um, he, with one partner, alternated cycling, one's in the car, one's on a bike, nine days, four hours, 11 minutes. And they crossed the continent, each riding, in that time, more than 1,500 miles. Now that's pretty impressive, isn't it? Would you stand? <laughs> really? <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah. He didn't want me to say that, but I just think it's incredible. That's right. <laughs> Do you hear that? To the praise of His glory. Boy, I love this guy. <laughs> so when I look at this passage, I'm thinking of worship. Now I look at the first verse of the unit. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. Pause. Blessed be God, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And again, forgive me, I can't but think of the Psalms. I can't but think of the language of the Psalms in which words like this take such strong um, uh, position. And with a finger in Ephesians 1, would you turn to Psalm 103? If you turn to Psalm 103, this is a familiar passage, and in the older translations, the word bless is used. Newer, they've turned it uh, to praise, but this is a distinct word for praise, the Hebrew verb barach, and this is familiar. Some of you have memorized this long ago. Psalm 103, verse 1, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. And here's a case where the Bible is self-interpreting. We understand something of what it means when we talk about God has blessed us, but uh, students who come to Psalm 103 and see the word blessed where the object is God, they say, how may I bless God? God blesses people. How do people bless God? And in the wonderful poetry, the parallelism of verse 2, which is antithetical, the interpretation comes that um, to bless God is to be unforgetful, not to be forgetful of His benefits, or to turn it around to have an active memory of all that God has done. 
And when we paraphrase that a bit, what the psalm is saying is that the people of God should bless God for all the blessings that God has done for us. And in Old Testament times, the focus was not just on earthly things. It was also on heavenly things. Look at what we read in verse 3 as there begins an enumeration of God's blessings. He forgives all your iniquities, heals all your diseases, redeems your life from destruction, crowns you with loving kindness, tender mercy, satisfies your mouth with good things so your youth is renewed like the eagles. And the Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are pressed. Verse 11, as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is His mercy towards those who fear Him. As far as the east from the west, so far as He removed our transgression from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear Him. For he knows our frame and he remembers that we are dust. And you read that psalm and you see the psalmist is saying, bless the Lord who has blessed us in a manifold variety of ways. And what is Paul saying in Ephesians 1? He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. And while the emphasis is more on our position with Christ, the resurrected one and the ascended one, and on the spiritual blessings that God has provided, nonetheless, I look at these passages and I see a biblical continuity. And Psalm 103 is a psalm of praise. It's a wisdom psalm, but it's a psalm designed to bring praise to God. And the book of Ephesians is a book designed not only to teach doctrine, but to bring praise to God, the Father, and God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. Now stay with me in the psalm for a moment. See how Psalm 103 begins, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Look at the way it ends, the same words. Verse 22 at the end, Bless the Lord, O my soul. So that there is a structure to this psalm, uh, of uh, inclusio, of repetition, the beginning and the ending that ties this psalm together beautifully. Now look at the next one, Psalm 104. Psalm 104 is also a wisdom psalm that's designed to elicit the praise and worship of God's people. And it begins in the same manner as 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And it ends in the same manner. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And then there's the word hallelujah. So that Psalms 103 and 104 can be thought of as, um, as a small unit within the book of Psalms. They're linked together by the liturgical beginning and ending, bless the Lord, O my soul. And the focus in Psalm 103 is on the work of God in our salvation and in protection and preservation and extending of life and bringing of blessings in these days and in the days to come. Psalm 104, the companion psalm, is a more complex psalm than 103, certainly in terms of its connections and origins. And the great scholars have read this psalm and have thought, my, that reminds me of a magnificent hymn in Egyptian poetry to the sun god Aten. And others have said, yes, but there are elements in this psalm that remind me even more strongly of some of the phrases used of Baal in Psalms uh, in uh, Canaanite literature found at Ugarit. But others have said, oh, yes, that's there, and yes, that's there. But even more, Psalm 104 is a rhapsody of the themes of creation found in Genesis chapter 1. And this psalm, which pairs with 103, is designed to do the same thing Psalm 103 does, and that's to bring the reader to the posture of worship. Because when we put both of these things together, what we discover is this. Everything God has done in bringing about our salvation is reason for giving praise to His name. Everything God has done in creation is reason for bringing praise to His name. So my message is, to God, all glory. Look at Psalm 104, just one verse, it's verse 24. This verse capsulizes the intent 
of the psalmist, I believe. O Lord, O Yahweh, how manifold are your works. And in this psalm, the works of God are his creative works and his preservation works for the universe, which is his handicraft, the work of his fingers. The psalmist uh, David says at one point, your heavens, the work of your fingers. Some years ago, when I was much younger than I am today, I was a guest professor at Regent College in Vancouver, British Columbia, for a summer course. And in those three weeks, I developed a friendship that lasted for the rest of his life with Dr. Carl F. H. Henry. I'll never forget meeting with him one hour every day, Monday to Friday, for uh, three weeks talking about wisdom literature in the Bible. Uh, I also met a person who was not as outgoing and friendly as Dr. Henry was. Um, he's with the Lord now, so I'll tell you his name as well, Dr. Donald Mackay. He was a British professor of brain science from the University of Kiel in England, and he and a partner from the Netherlands were paired together to teach a course called The Bible and Science. And at our first meeting at uh, a meal, he was on my right, and I said, I saw the course, descript uh, the course title, you're teaching a course on the Bible and science. And he looked a little over toward where I was, and he says, yes, that's correct. And um, was not very warm, this fellow. <laughs> and then I said, trying to develop a conversation, I said, well, I suspect your course is about uh, creation and evolution, at which he took great pain in putting both implements down, holding them in different hands than I normally do, and putting those down firmly on his plate and looking down at me through his long British nose and saying, my dear young man, see, I was younger then, my dear young man, my course is not about evolution. <laughs> he said, our course, and his um, a Dutch compatriot, uh, or fellow teacher was at his right, he says, our course is designed for students in the sciences at UBC to learn how to incorporate a Christian worldview as they're doing science. And I thought, oh, that is, that's wonderful. And I didn't think of this verse, but I thought of one very much like it, Psalm 111, verse 2. And I said, here's a verse that you might like to use in your course. And uh, when I said that, he didn't take it too friendly, but um, he listened. And I said, look at this verse, uh, Psalm 111. It's a wisdom psalm with praise as well. Look at this. The works of the Lord are great, pursued by all who find pleasure in them. And I said, my understanding of that verse is that God has created His works in such a manner that those who have the ability to study, whether it's psychology um, uh, or hard sciences like um, chemistry, that when you study the created works of God, you can take pleasure in them because in them you're directed to the wonder of God. And at that point, he looked at me like a real person and he said, my dear young man, I'm going to make that the theme verse of our course. That was a great moment. <laughs> but look at that. The works of the Lord are great. And those who take pleasure in what, is, uh, what God has done, they're the ones who pursue those things with the view to giving glory to God. Some years ago, I got a phone call from Moish Rosen, the creative founder of Jews for Jesus. He was in San Francisco, and I was in Portland. And he said, Ron, I want you to do a favor for me. I'd like you to conduct a wedding in Portland for friends of mine. And I said, Moish, I'm not a marrying Sam. And he said, I've done a few weddings. But he says, no, I really want you to do this. He says, I would do it, but I can't. I'm scheduled to be elsewhere, and I just can't do it. I want you to do it. And I said, well, what's the story? He said, well, there's a young man and a young woman who live in Philadelphia. She's from Czechoslovakia. This is before the Czech Republic and the fall of the Soviet Union. She's from Czechoslovakia. She was raised Catholic. 
And she's come to faith in Yeshua through a Messianic assembly in Philadelphia, where she met her fiancé, who is a Jewish uh, fellow from Portland, Oregon. All of her family is behind the Iron Curtain. There's no point in trying to have a family wedding for her. All of his family is in Portland, and they're all Jews, and not one of them is open to coming to a Christian wedding. What I want you to do is do a Jewish wedding for them and tweak it Christian. <laughs> and, and the story, uh, as it turned out, was just fabulous, and it, and it turned out wonderful. We had it in a neutral site, a hotel. We couldn't do it in a church. They wouldn't come. We couldn't do it in a synagogue. I couldn't officiate there. A rabbi wouldn't let me, so uh, we asked. So we had it in a hotel, and um, I wore my academic robe, because they expected a robe, but without the colors. And uh, <laughs> people knew that I was a Baptist preacher, but I did everything. I mean, actually, when I talked to Moish, I said, Moish, I can't do that. The closest I've been to a Jewish wedding is seeing the film Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> and he said, yeah, but you're a quick study. You can learn. And so I did. And so we had, um, we had everything that you would find in a Jewish wedding, except I tweaked it. And after the wedding, one of the uncles of the young man came up to me, and he gave me a big hug, and he says, you're a Baptist preacher? I said, yes. He says, well, I didn't know your weddings are just like ours. <laughs> I said, well, ordinarily they're not. But he said, the prayers, you did the prayers. And he started one of them. They all start the same. Uh, you know, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu, blessed are you, Yahweh. And they all start the same. I said, did you hear the ending? He says, well, I'm not really good at Hebrew. So when I ended the prayers, B'shem Ha'av, U'b'shem Ha'bein, U'b'shem Ha'ruach, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. You didn't hear that, did you? He said, you said that? <laughs> But you all said amen. <laughs> After the wedding was the wedding dinner. And at the wedding dinner, I was seated with a couple and his family. And um, I said to Marina, you know, all of your premarital counseling was done in Philadelphia by the pastor of the Messianic Church. And all we've talked about, all we've talked about uh, is the wedding, and you're going back. Tell me a little about your work. And she said, like Gary Barnes, very uh, un, uh, you know, affected by her accomplishments, she says, well, I have three earned PhDs in chemistry. And uh, she said, I work for a major uh, corporation as a research chemist. But she says, since I came to faith in Yeshua, now she's smiling, she says, I've gotten special permission to go to my lab a half an hour before it opens. And because everything is so secure, they dock my wages to have guards there with me because I can't be there alone. And I get there a half an hour before anyone else, and I put on my lab jacket, and I arrange my materials, and then I get down on my knees and I read from a psalm or two, and then I pray that everything I do this day will wind up bringing help to man and glory to God. And she epitomized this ideal, Psalm 111, verse 2, and Psalm 104, verse 24. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works! In wisdom you've made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. And there's a wonderful play on that word, which is from kana, that can mean to create and means to hold and to own. And everything God has made is designed to bring glory to his name. So turn to Ephesians and we'll be done, this time to chapter 3. Everything God has done in our salvation is designed to make us worshipers of living God. All glory to Him. 
Everything God has done in creation is designed to make us worshipers. To God be all glory. And Paul ends the first section of Ephesians in just that manner. Verse 14, he says, I bow my knees. That's a posture of prayer and worship. And verse 20, these words of magnificent doxology, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. If that's not a call to worship, I don't know what could be. Everything that God has done in our salvation is a call to his worship. Everything he's done in creation is a call to his worship. For in the Bible, it is to God all glory. Our Father, we ask that these words will animate our living and bring even greater enthusiasm to our worship as we think about you and what you've done uh, for us and forever. In Jesus' name, amen.